actually getting the interview. Um, that's that's what we want to talk about today to try to give you some insight into specifically some of the the questions that are commonly asked in interviews. And let me share my screen because it probably helps as I talk that I am actually showing you things. And all right. Uh, so is everyone able to see the slide deck on the screen? And just um, just let us know in chat if you're not able to. It might take a minute to show on your screen there. Um, so kind of the way this is going to be structured, I'm going to run through this, this slide deck. I'll try to do it as quickly as possible. I hate PowerPoint slides. I know most of you probably hate it, um, but it's a necessary evil, especially in the corporate world. But we are going to cover some, some general um, job interview questions that are asked, uh, typically asked in the screening. So the initial screen from like HR or a recruiter, uh, as well as they may be asked by the hiring manager. And it just kind of depends on where you interview at, um, what, what's going to be asked. Most places these days are doing about anywhere from three to five rounds of interviews for any job outside of like, you know, senior leadership where you've got a lot more interviews and all the checks and all that good stuff. Um, but for most of you on this call, you're going to be going into the individual contributor roles or what we call individual contributors. So as your general cybersecurity professionals, and those types of roles are generally around three to five rounds of interviews. Uh, first one is usually going to be a some kind of a phone screen or maybe an email screen, but usually like a Zoom call with a recruiter or or um, HR person. And they're going to ask you some some basic questions usually not too bad. And then you'll usually have the next one with hiring manager. And then after that, it might be like panel interview, or you might just meet a couple members of the, of the team. And then in some cases, you might also um, interview with like some senior leader at the company, depending on the size of the company, so they can vet you a little more. I'll tell you right now from experience, if you're getting like eight rounds of interviews, the company sucks, unless it's like a Google or something. And even Google doesn't put you through that many. So just keep that in mind that it's probably not the right fit and you probably want to just save your, 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 your time and go someplace else. So anyways, we're going to talk about uh, what I call the world famous question. Uh, Gina's graciously volunteered to, uh, to give an answer to that. And then I'll show you kind of a structure, how to answer that along with some of the common questions I mentioned. We'll talk about the mental game. This is actually, in my opinion, the most important thing, but most people ignore it and, and just try everything else. You know, they collect certs and degrees and all this stuff, but really the mental game, is the starting point of what you need. We'll talk about some of the fears of interviewers, just so you can kind of get in the mind of the person you might be interviewing with. We'll talk about bias a little bit, um, especially this being uh, probably a lot of people that don't are not pale white guys like me on the call. So realistically, you're going to have some bias you're going to be dealing with. So we'll talk about how you can actually deal with that in interviews. We'll talk a little bit about behavioral interview questions. You probably, you all have probably heard of some of the ways to answer those. Um, also, I think Gina was going to email out. I shared a document with her. That's a, a, a I think it's, I forget how many pages. It is a lot of uh, behavioral interview questions. And many of them you're going to be asked verbatim in job interviews. So study that list, for, you know, practice your answers for those. And you, and you should do pretty well, at least on the behavioral interview side of the house. And then we'll talk about as well, uh, avoiding self-sabotage. So, Gina, I know you're still helping to admit people that are coming in late, but um, can you just give us a kind of a quick answer, if you would, to tell me about yourself? Like, how would you answer that question in an interview? Okay. Well, this is one of the hardest questions for me, but I would definitely say that I have experience in everything from emergency services to youth ministry to operations now with Black Girls Hack. But my goal is to position myself as a leader um, that empowers other that empowers people, but also opens doors for others to get into the industry as well. Excellent. So pretty good answer there. Um, depending on the role. So this question, you want to tailor it to whatever the role is, you know, so you gave, you gave kind of a breadth. Uh, and, and again, Gina answered that actually better than 99% of people when I asked that, you know, most people are like, I'm a lifelong learner and I like to take long walks on the beach and like, this is not dating, right? Like, you need to be specific. So Gina did a, a very good job without us having actual position or anything like that that she's going for. So um, good job, Gina, on that. You get a gold star from me. So let's talk about how do we actually answer this question? Like what's kind of a structure to do so? So this, tell me about yourself. What they're really trying to look for is just a, a brief overview of who you are professionally, a couple of really a couple of specific things that are tied to the role. It could even be just one thing. Like I did, you know, this, I worked this project and this is a result. And then why do you even want to be here? Like, why are you, why'd you apply for this job? Why are you on this interview? So 
I have an example here. I'm not going to read all that to you, but basically it talks about your background. Uh, you know, you've got some experience. You did this, you know, particular project, and this is the the end result. You, you're not going to always have metrics, but the, is where you can try to put those in. And then, why did this opportunity catch your eye? Because you know, blah blah blah. And this this answer I give here is kind of generic. Oh, the company mission, etc. The more specific you can you can get, the better. And what this does when you answer it this way, when you kind of take this structure and you answer the question this way. Number one, I can't answer the question the same way as you, right? It's not a generic question that I can just answer the same as everybody else because it's based on your experience and, and your results that you've gotten. And then number two, as an interviewer, if I'm not a well-trained interviewer, which the vast majority of people don't get any training when they go to interview you, I'm automatically going to be impressed with you because you're not like everybody else. You're not the person saying, oh, I'm a lifelong learner. Look at me. You're the person that comes in, you're showing me measurable result, results. So when I go back and I say, hey, let me tell you about Gina. She's been in healthcare cybersecurity for three years. She said she worked on a project at ABC Hospital. She built some automation. It reduced, I forget the exact number, but it was like 10 or 11%. It reduced their support tickets to save them money. And she's really wanted to be here because she believes in our mission. What you do in that situation is you make it easy for someone else to sell you to everybody else in the company. And that's what you really want with the job interviews. You want an internal champion that's saying, oh my goodness, this person is phenomenal. We've got to hire them. So this is a, a structure. And um, I think, so Gina, I'll share the slide deck so, you can sh so everyone can get a copy of this afterwards. So you don't have to worry about taking notes for this presentation. But anyways, that's how you answer that one. Um, I do want to be mindful of time. So I'm going to jump, just keep jumping through. So another question you're going to get usually from the hiring manager is where do you see yourself in five years? I mean, I don't know where, I don't know what I'm going to do in five years. None of us do. Right. And they don't know. They don't. So the, the wrong way to answer this is like what most people tell you to do. Like, Oh, I'm going to be in your job or I'm going to be the CEO of the company. Yeah. And maybe you will probably not in five years. So, right. Like that's not realistic. If you've ever, if anyone's on the call has ever started a business, Five years, if you're this business owner, sure, you could be CEO. For anyone else, probably not going to happen. Really what we're looking for with this question is we want to see that, number one, you want to master the role that you're, you're applying for. Like, I don't want you focused on a CISO role or, or CISO, depending on who you ask how to pronounce it. I don't want you focused on that role if I'm hiring you for an entry level, like tier one soccer role. I, I don't want you focused on CISO because you're not getting there yet right? I want you to focus and master on this role. So the way to answer this particular question is just talking about how you're going to master this role. So here's an example here, you know, I'm going to take the next year, fully learn this role, basically, you know, master it so I can focus on the company's needs. And then I want to be the go-to person, you know, for X, you know, and X is whatever, you know, if you're a SOC analyst, cybersecurity analyst, engineer, pen tester, whatever GRC, whatever role you're going into, you essentially want to establish that you want to become a master at that as you evolve your career. And that's the way to answer this question. Because now, as a hiring manager, I don't know what the budget is in five years. I don't know if I can get you in that role you want, that specific job title or anything like that. But I do know that you're going to take the next year. So we know we got you for at least a year. That relieves a lot of pressure on me as a hiring manager. I know I've got you for a year, at least in theory. You're not going to jump around jobs. And then I know that you want to become the go-to person. So I start thinking in my head, okay, well, how can I help her or him or they, you know, however you gender identify, how can I help them become that go-to person? Like what, you know, I can, I start planning out trainings that I can send you to. I start planning out who I can connect you to in the company. All of a sudden you become an asset and not a liability. So this is the way you want to answer this question. You talk about mastering the current role, however you want to word it. So use your own wording. And then also talk about how you, make, you want to become that go-to person or that thought leader in that particular area in, you know, in the future, in the coming years. Um, and that's, again, that's the way you answer this particular question, at least in my opinion. Um, another question, we only got this question and one, one other one. We're going to dive into the rest of things. What's your greatest weakness? Um, most people, I don't have any weaknesses. Really, the purpose of this question is to really understand, are you self-aware? Are you aware enough of your strengths, weaknesses? And maybe you're not right now. And, and even if you do a self-assessment, you're like, I still don't really think I'm weak in anything. Ask other people and ask them to be brutally, brutally honest and say, look, I'm trying to get a, a, you know, my dream job and I need to find some weakness. I need to figure out what a weakness is. Like, is there anything I can improve? You can ask your current boss. You can ask your coworkers. You can ask your friends, family. I mean, people often see the things that we don't see and because, and 
and they're too nice. They don't want to bring it up like, oh, you suck at this or that. So you have to just say, look, be brutally honest. And this is the, you know, because I'm trying to do this thing, you know, and the word because and the word, but are little things you can do also in the job interview. For example, um, if someone's like, you don't have the experience we need. Yeah. Yes. I don't have the, you know, five years of experience, but I do have X, Y, and Z in human psychology. And, and this is in the market for anyone that on the call that's been in marketing at all, this is human psychology for marketing, the, but people forget everything before the, but. So afterwards it's like, Oh, okay. So when you use the word, but in like sales copy, you rationalize why they would want you. And so in the same way you can do that, do that in a job interview and say, Hey, I, yeah, I don't have these things you're looking for, but I have all these other things. And so, subliminally in their mind, they start focusing on the, all the other things you bring to the table and not the thing that you don't. Um, same thing with because, you know, you're just kind of rationalizing in their head of why they should hire you for certain things. So anyways, back to greatest weaknesses. When you're inter answering this in an interview, state the weakness. Here's the weakness. How are you actually working to resolve it? Because I want to see that you're, you're doing, you, you've recognized it. Sure. You found a problem. Show me that you're working to solve it because in, in, uh, in the job, I'm going to have problems for you. And if you can convey that you've found your own problem, you've got a solution, you're working, you know, you're working on a solution and you can explain the improvement so far. So where are you, you know, in the process? I can see that you're a problem solver. And again, we, we, you always want the hiring manager to see you as a, as what we call a high performer. High performers are the ones that can go in and get double the salary or double the, you know, total compensation package. The, these are the people that can go in and people just like you, that have the same level of skill as you, that have the same experience, that have you know all these things as you, the exact same resume even sometimes, are high performers because of the way they carry themselves in the job interview, the way they convey themselves. They're, they're recognized as high performers. And the more you do that, the more you can negotiate things and you can kind of call the shots versus being like everybody else in the job interview. So greatest weakness, talk about the weakness, how you're working to resolve it, like what, what's going on right now. And then what, you know, what's, what's happening? Like how much progress have you made towards that? And where can you improve, you know, in the future? And then of course you probably figured out the next question was what is your greatest strength? So here, just talk about the strength, like what is it? And then give a specific example of when you used it. So if you say, I've got great project management skills, tell me about that. Like give it an actual example of you running a project. If you say you've got, oh, I'm a great communicator. Okay. Give me a specific example maybe with an irate customer or something, or, or your coworkers were being jerks. Like, how did you handle that? Tell me about the communication and what you did and break it down for me. You know, what was the problem? What is the action you took? And what was the end result? You know, so again, specific here for greatest strength. Um, if there's any questions as we go through this, I'm going to open up at the end for questions, but if there's any questions, just throw them in the chat so Gina and I can um, surface those and make sure we get them answered before we end today here. Uh, and then let's talk about the mental game. Again, th this, in my opinion, is the number one thing you need to focus on right now. This uh, is really critical to allowing you to focus. And really, when you focus on something without getting all woo-woo and stuff like that, but um, but when you focus on something, you brought you bring it to you. You know, The more you focus on it, the more you take action towards it, the, the faster it comes to you, good or bad. So if you start talking about, oh, I'm going to get laid off. Oh, my gosh. Oh, layoffs, all this stuff. Then guess what? You're going to be in the next round of layoffs usually. Um, so just keep that in mind that, that, you know, the things you focus on. So anyways, mastering the mental game. First thing you need to do before you even apply for jobs, in my opinion, is take this little self-assessment. And I usually just do a scale of one to 10. So is this position going to be meaningful work for you? And do you care about meaningful work? Maybe you don't. Maybe you're like, I want to stack cash right now and make a lot of money. That's all I care about. I don't care if it's meaningful or, or not. But for others on this call, you might, you want to, you want work that's actually got a purpose behind it, where you feel like you're doing some good in the world. And then money, is money important to you on a scale of one to 10? I mean, of course, everyone's got bills to pay. Um, if you don't, let me know. You can have some of mine. But um, money, you know, how important is, so a lot of people look at, at big tech companies and these articles out there, people talking about, I made 800 grand, you know, at a Twitter or I think it was Meta. I saw an article recently on software engineering. They made 800 grand at Meta. Most of that was uh, uh, what's called restricted stock units or basically stock at, at larger companies. And a lot of people look at that and say, oh, I make a lot of money. But flip side of that is, do you have time freedom? Because I can tell you right now at a major tech company, you're living there. You're going to live at the office. You're not going to, you're not going to be off at five every day to, to tuck your kid in or have dinner with them. That's not realistic, right? Because at that level, 
you have you're very it's very competitive and based on what they're paying you they're expecting a massive return out of you um, typically speaking as a and myself as a business owner if i hire someone i expect a 10x on their salary in the first year at, at least so for example if i pay you 100 grand i'm expecting you to produce a million at these major tech companies they're looking for a 20 to 30x usually on your base salary so if you're making let's say a half million dollars you can do the math on that of how much work they're expecting you to do to produce for them so you have to ask yourself, is it worth it? Maybe if you're single right now and you don't have kids and stuff like that, maybe you can do the big tech companies. Maybe that's fine. Maybe you don't care about time freedom for the first couple of years. But other people on this call, you've got kids, you've got other responsibilities. Maybe you want more time. I know a guy that works in cyber. He gets off at five o'clock every day. Doesn't He doesn't even make six figures. He makes, I think, 70 grand or so a year. But he gets off at five every day, has dinner with a family. He doesn't do any on-call work. He doesn't have to deal with chaotic incidents. Like he has very little responsibility in his job. He's got what, what a lot of people call a boring job, but he's got the life that he wants. So you have to ask yourself what, what's more important here. And the same thing like fun and, and also with regret. Will I regret this job in a couple of years? And you may not know all these answers. You know, your answers will change. You know, this is a fluid assessment, but things do you need to keep in mind before you go jumping in and throwing your application into like Facebook or something. Right. Um, and then a couple of books I, I mentioned here. And again, um, Gina will share the slides via email for everyone, but these are books I actually use. I have a, I have a ton of books. I have to purge every so often because it's, it's crazy and, and uh, frustrates my wife sometimes, but anyways, lazy man's way to riches. The very first edition, I think it was published in the 1970s. So a long time ago for some of you younger people on the call and for some of us older people on the call, not too long ago, uh, but the first edition is the best one. It's very short to, to read through, and it's basically for goal setting. So your life goals, it's, it's a very good book for that. Um, a lot of people will hear the words like manifestation, stuff like this, that. So the, the intention experiment by McTaggart actually backs that up. Your, you know, your thought process backs that up with science. So you can see uh, the proof on that. And the last half of that book actually gives you specific exercises. So um, again, you don't have to buy these books. I don't get any cut of this. This is not a promotion for them by any means. Um, but these are books that I've actually used. Uh, Change Your Life in Three Minutes by uh, Hillier. I think her first name's Reagan or something like that. And then the Silva Mind Control Method. So Sil uh, Jose Silva uh, has a lot of stuff around... Um, uh, the alpha state, like your, you know, and meditation, things like that. So anyways, you can look up some of these things on YouTube as well for free, but the books themselves, I don't think you can find those on um, social media. I think you'd have to buy them, but they're all, you can get a used copy. In fact, the lazy man's way to riches. I don't think you can find a new copy. They've got a newer version of it. That sucks, but they the old original edition. Um, I've got a used copy of it. So I don't think you can find the original, but anyways, some books I recommend for, for those out there that love books and you can get them audio books too, but I, I like, I'm old, I'm a little old. So I like um, paperbacks. Anyways, let's dive into interviewers biggest fears. So what are some of the concerns? And most of these are like, they're not going to tell you like, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm scared of this or that you know, I'm, I'm, this is my fear. They're, they're not going to tell you this. So let's just talk about what some of these fears are. So number one fear that I have as a hiring manager is you can't do the job. So I hire you for something. You've talked a big game on your resume. You've somehow gotten yourself through the interview, talking a big game. You know, you're, you're very good at that. And day one on the job, you totally blow it. And for the first 90 days, you just make me look like a total, uh, I'm trying not to curse. You make me look like a total idiot. Let's just say that you can't do the job. And as part of that, you lack the skills or experience. Now, again, experience, depending on the role you're going for, if you can show that you've got transferable skills, I may give you a chance if you're, again, showing me that you're what, a, what we call a high performer. Quiet quitting. Um, there's, I, I, thankfully, I didn't hire these people, but there's been some people that will master, you know, the resume, they'll, you know, they'll get a service, whatever, to write the resume for them. They'll master the interview process. And then you hire them and they don't do anything. They, they, for anyone old enough to remember the movie Office Space, and if you never watched that movie, it's a cult classic in the IT world. So I encourage you to go look at that or at least look on like YouTube or TikTok or something for some little clips. But the movie Office Space, it came out, I think in 99, maybe 1999. Um, so before some of you probably were born on this call. Uh, but Peter, Peter Gibbons, the main character in the movie, is the epitome of what we now call quiet quitting. He's doing basically just enough not to get fired from his job. And that's the biggest fear I have as well as a hiring manager is, hey, you're going to do the bare minimum and you're not going to be the high performer that I thought you were. So that's another fear. Um, no autonomy. So if you don't know what autonomy means, it just basically means that I can let you go on your own and, and solve problems and do things and run your own schedule. 
I don't want, I really don't want people that are needy. I, I can't deal with needy people. I don't hire them in my companies. I do not hire needy people because I need to be able to, there's problems that I don't know how to solve. I need to be able to say, look, Gina, here's, here's a problem. What ideas do you have to solve this and let you just run with it? Because I have to trust you to do that because otherwise, why am I hiring you? If I've got to do all the work all the time and come in and be involved in everything, what's the point of me paying you money? I'll just pay myself extra money and do the, and do extra hours. And not a team player or a hater. So what we don't want as hiring managers is we don't want those bad apples that complain all the time. Like if you're a complainer, for, first off, um, I think it was Harvard Medical School actually did a study on com people that complain and it actually causes brain damage. So look that up. It was either Harvard or Yale or Stanford, one of those big Ivy League schools that um, I'm still waiting for Gina to pay my tuition at. But anyways, they did a study on complaining and they found that it actually causes brain damage. So I'm, I'm as a hiring manager, once I figured that out, I'm like, I'm never going to hire a complainer, but also they're poison for the team. So if you're not a team player, if you're a hater, you're not going to get hired. If I can figure that out in an interview, there's no chance you're moving forward at all. Dishonest, lack of integrity. I mean, this is little things. Like if I, if I, if I deliberately, and some companies do this, um, and I, I actually did this one time as well. And I weeded out some people, um, not for my companies when I was working corporate and I left some money just in the waiting area, you know, where people waited to, to come and interview and all that stuff. And I wanted to see, I had the secretary, um, well, her title wasn't secretary, but basically the front office person, um, I had her monitor. And we also looked at the cameras to see like who would just pick up the money and like give it to her and say, Hey, there's some money or who would ignore it or who would put it in their pocket. And the people that put it in their pocket, we immediately canceled their interviews. Because this is dishonest, right? It's not your money. If you're on the street or something, sure. But like you're in an office, like the right thing to do is say, hey, I found this. And we may tell you like, yeah, just put it in your pocket. You know, no big deal. Um, finders keepers, right? But dishonesty is a huge thing because if you're, if you're dishonest in something like that, how dishonest are you going to be on the job? You're going to become an insider threat for me. And I don't want that in my company. Um, no show. And this is not about the interview. This is actually about the job. Like I hire you and you never show up. So along with the quiet quitting, you just don't show up. Slow learner. And that's not saying that if you have like a, a disability or special ability in learning, that's a bad thing. But I need someone that at some point can do the job. I don't need someone that that like I keep sending through trainings and, you know, spend tens of thousands of dollars on different instructors and all this stuff. And you're still, you know, six months out, still not able to do one thing on the job. I don't want someone like that. I just can't afford to have that, you know, especially as a small business owner. And then of course, someone that's already looking like, why even show up? And again, that goes back to that self-assessment. If you're just getting this job and that, and that's fine, right? You got bills to pay. If you're just getting this job though, to just get the job to pay your bills, I'm not going to tell you to be dishonest in the interview, but like at least hide that in the interview if that's all you're trying to do, if you're already looking. But my recommendation is like, find something you're going to stay at. Because that's how you actually get yourself in a good financial position. It's not by changing jobs every six months, um, unless you get a lot more money. But for the most part, if you stay at a place a couple of years, you should be getting raises, especially larger companies. And then all this stuff could lead to me potentially as an interviewer, if I'm just, you know, corporate type, I could potentially get fired if, you know, if these things happen because you're making me look so bad. And then just keeping going into some of the other biggest fears, you know, you don't prepare for the interview itself. Um, that's just a, I mean, like you can tell when people don't do research on a company, you should know the company culture, in my opinion, before you come to the interview, that should not be a question you ever ask. I am going to give you a question in a little bit here that you should always ask when they ask you, Hey, do you have any questions for us? There's one question I always recommend you ask, cause it's going to give you so much insight into how you need to approach the rest of the interview process. Uh, but don't prepare. You, you don't listen in the interview. You talk too much. Some people say, Oh, this is your time to shine. You need to control the interview. You need to blah, blah, blah. That works fine for an untrained interviewer, but any company with a mature process, especially larger companies, if you're talking too much, you're turning them off essentially, right? You're, they look at you as like, okay, you're just kind of BSing your way through the interview. You're not giving me the, the specific measurable uh, information I need to fill out my form that I've got, you know, my checklist, I've got to go off properly. And I mentioned earlier that list that Gina shared out of behavioral interview questions. A lot of those questions are, are again, asked verbatim in interviews and they're on a checklist. So the interviewer just goes on the checklist and they check off, you know, you on these different questions and, and give you a score essentially. Um, your body language in the interview shows that you're not interested. You're just kind of lazy. You, you know, you're sitting back, you're like, yeah, whatever. Um, I'm not going to hire you. I'm not going to move you to the next round usually because it's like, you don't want to be here. 
is what I'm getting. Maybe that's not true. So if you, you need to record yourself preparing for an interview, like pretend you're in an interview and just look at your body language afterwards and say, am I, and have other, like your friends and family look at it too and say, am I, um, am I conveying that I actually want to be in this interview or not? And then desperation, like literally, if you're in an interview, like, please, please hire me. You're not getting hired. I can tell you that right now. Same thing with social media. If you connect with someone, you're immediately like, please, please give me a job. Nobody wants a desperate person because you're desperate. And as soon as something else comes along, you're going to take it. And it's, it's expensive. If, if anyone on the calls never worked as a hiring manager or ran a budget, it's expensive to hire people. Um, depending on the role, it could be anywhere from 50 to 100 grand to hire someone and, you know, and, and go through that entire process. So I don't want to spend that money if I don't have to. So if you're desperate, you're not getting the job. All right. So we talked about, you know, kind of red flags. Like how do you actually impress these people though? Prepare for the interview. That's hands down the number one thing. Know about the company, know what the company does, you know, have a grasp on that, know about your role and kind of how it would tie into the bigger picture. Um, look at some of the recent uh, social media the company's put out. Like, are they working certain projects? Are there anything you find interesting? These are all things that can help you in the interview when they ask you, what do you know about our company? Then you can actually answer that question effectively. Listen to the interviewer. Oftentimes they'll actually give you the answers. And I'll, like I said, I'll talk about a question in a little bit here. Oftentimes they'll give you the exact answers you need for later interviews. So if you're talking to the recruiter or the HR person, oftentimes if you just listen to them, they're going to give you little little tips and tricks and insights and things like that. So when you go to the hiring manager, you can ace the interview because you know that what they're looking for. Be positive. Again, going back to the mindset stuff, right? If, if you're a negative person in the interview and a complainer, I, like, oh my gosh, traffic was so bad. I don't care about that, right? Leave early next time for an interview. If you're late, whatever. I mean, nowadays, most interviews are done via Zoom or Teams or whatever. Why are you late to the interview, right? You should come on. You should try to detect, you know, get your tech set up in advance, try to show up a few minutes early. Even if I start the interview right at the time, you should show up a couple minutes early so you can handle all that stuff, make sure it's all working properly. And then be concise in your response. Um, some people use a STAR method, the um, situation, task, action, and result, I think is what it is. Uh, but I, I like problem, action, result, because really you're going to be telling like a story. You're going to be basically telling the situation. And you're going to be talking about the tasks that you did. All that's wrapped into problem action result. Cause that's how we talk as humans. We don't, we don't just, you know, we don't tell the story first and then talk about what we did. That doesn't make any sense. So problem action result is one I like to tell people to use. It, it makes it a lot easier, a lot easier to answer your questions. Um, ask about some of their challenges. Like, okay, what, what challenges are you, what problems are you trying to solve with this role? Like what are some of the things you're trying to solve with this position? And then, when you send a thank you like email, and actually I think I've got some, um, Gina, I'll share that with you as well, Gina, um, the, over the weekend. I've got some ways to respond with like a thank you to them, uh, kind of a structured response. And so I'll share that with Gina so she can send it out to everybody as well. So, you, so when you actually interview, send them an email. You can also, what I like to do is um, mail a thank you card to the company, or you can also uh, send like a certified letter. If So if you don't have an email, which you should for the interviewer, but if you don't, then you can do the old school format, which sometimes impresses them because nobody does that anymore. And then as part of the, the challenges, um, you, may not, you may not know that in advance of the interview. So what you can do is you can try to do some research of like, okay, based on this role or based on the job description, here's some things I think that, they may have, you know, they may be trying to solve this position. And sometimes they'll tell you in the job description, like we're looking for someone that can build automation or whatever. And so what you can do is prepare a short slide deck, a very short slide deck. You know, first slide is just you, little overview of you and your information. Um, the next three slides are your 30, 60, 60 day and 90 day plans for how you're going to solve the problem. Or you could also do it a different way. And you can um, talk in that, in the slide deck about what you're going, what you're planning to do at the company. And again, you may not know all this in advance, but you can try to get a plan in place. Like, look, these are some of the, because a hiring manager, they may not know what they're going to do with you when they hire you. They may not have a plan in place. They might have a few ideas, but you can, you might be able to come in there with a 30 day, 60 day, 90 plan of like what you're going to contribute to the organization. Again, just a couple of bullet, bullet points. And then the last slide deck is just kind of a, a quick, like three to five bullet points of uh, this is the last slide in the, the deck is um, three to five bullet points of your skills related to the role just to kind of refresh your memory on who you are. Now, when you when you um, get in that interview, and this is, the slide deck's more for the hiring manager once you get past that phone screen person. So when you get in with the hiring manager and that team, 
the slide deck, you could say up front, like, hey, I've actually prepared a short slide deck. It's, you know, just five slides. Do you mind if I share that real quick before we get started, just so I can talk through a couple of points? 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to say yes. And 99.9% .9 of the time, no matter what's on the slide deck, unless you really mess it up, they're going to be completely impressed with you because you took the time to do a little slide deck and nobody else did. So again, these little things, an interview is just a, a series of getting them to say yes. If you have an interview scheduled, you already have the job unless you screw up the interview or unless they have two, two or three people that are just way too similar in qualifications. And in those cases, they have to make a tough decision. But the vast majority of the time, you already have the job because they see something in you to schedule the inter interview. And unless you, you know, you just want to keep wilding them essentially, right? Unless you screw it up, you should get a job offer in most cases. At a minimum, you should get moved to the next round in the interview process. So I mentioned several times that there was a question I want you to ask in interviews. When they say, and especially in the phone screen, usually you only get like two or three minutes at the end because they've, they've talked too much, asking you a bunch of questions. They say, you have any questions for us? Ask this question. You can ask other things after that, but ask this question first. What seems to be missing from other candidates you've interviewed so far? This is golden. They're going to tell you exactly what's missing, what, you know, what the gap is. And now, you know, when you go to the next round of the interview, you know exactly what to talk to, because guess what? This is what everyone else is missing and you have it, or you can talk to how you're going to get it or how your, your transferable skills are going to match to what they're, what's missing. This works so well. And, and it also impresses them so much. Um, using this question, I never did not get moved to the next round in an interview. Um, after that phone screen and people that I know that have actually given me feedback on using it, they've never not been moved to the next round with a hiring manager. Um, so, so far, at least from people that have given me feedback in my own experience, there's a hundred percent pass rate on that first interview. So this would be something I would suggest you, I strongly suggest you ask in an interview. I can't tell you what to do, but if you're going to ask one question of them, this is the number one question to ask them. And hopefully that makes sense to everybody. All right. Um, we're getting getting there on the slides. I know we're we're about halfway through or so here, um, but on the slides, we're we're getting close to the end here. I'm trying to talk fast. So um, again, if you got questions as we go through this, throw them in chat. We'll make sure we get all those answered for you. So interview bias. Um, let's be realistic. Even even as a as a pale the palest white guy in the world, I still experience bias in interviews, right? Because the interviewer, you know, I I think a certain way. I'm very focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some people aren't, right? Some people are are proponents of the system and all that stuff. So there's always going to be bias, no matter what, because we as humans are different, even if we grew up similar and things like that to to others, and if we look the same and things like that. I mean. Uh, you may be a black woman on this call and a black woman may be interviewing you, but they may have bias against you because you didn't grow up in the same neighborhood as them or something like that, right? There's all these biases out there. So um, some of them are things like stereotypes, um, you know, uh, you grew up in the hood, so you must be a certain way, right? You must be a drug dealer, a gang member, um, you have a certain race or you have a certain gender identification, and it looks like my slides are a little wacky here on the bullets, but forgive me on that. Um, first impression bias is is essentially when I look at you on, on the Zoom call, what are my first sub, subconscious impressions of you? Are you dressed well? Are you presenting yourself well? Are you in a, uh, I shared with Gina before the call, there was a, a dude, I, I didn't interview him, but this guy showed up in a tank top to an interview. Um, so are you that guy, right? Are you that guy that sh or gal that showed up to an interview in a tank top? That's not a good first impression for corporate. Corporate's very rigid, very um, quote unquote boring, at least in my opinion, but it's a game. And if you learn to play the game, you can master the game and you can make a lot of money and, and, and have a great career um, in the corporate world. Similar to me is um, if, uh, so for example, if you're able to find out who the interviewer is in advance and go on social media and just look at some of the things they're interested in, you can bring that up in the interview and now they feel like they're similar to you, right? Some, this person's similar to me because they like these things that I like. So similar to me is, is you know, subconscious, we, we try to find some connection to people. And, and the more you're able to kind of flesh that out, um, you can address that particular bias. And unconscious bias um, is another one where I may not be aware as an interviewer that I've got these you know, biases going on, but they still, you know, exist. Recency bias is I'm going to remember the last person I interviewed. So if you can, when you schedule interviews, try to get the last slot of the day, uh, especially if you can interview on a Friday at the end of the day, because all weekend long, especially if you impress them, they're going to be thinking about you for the job. They're going to forget about everybody else they interviewed for the week for the most part. 
right? If you can't get the interview at the end of the day or like end of the week, anything like that, then again, you want to do the thank you emails, you know, things like that to resurface yourself as the number one candidate for the job. And then age, um, I mentioned Gina and I are, are only in our early 20s, but let's be realistic, I'm not. And there may be some bias based on the the age, you know, your age, you know, ageism is a real thing. Uh, one of the concerns around age specifically is, oh, this person can't take any direction from like a younger, you know, member of the team or whatever. So if you feel that you're in an interview with with someone that, and you just feel like there's maybe, you know, it's not going so well because you, you feel like, yeah, I think there's some ageism going on. The way to address that is say, you know, I just want to be, you know, can I, can I say something or whatever, you know, let, you know, interrupt them a little bit, let them say, yeah, it's okay. Say, you know, I just want to address, you know, um, some companies I've interviewed at have concerns that based on my age, that maybe I can't work with, you know, a younger team or that I can't take direction from a younger boss, but, you know, and, and if you, you know, remember the button, because I mentioned earlier, but, and then mention a specific example of either a, a real example you've gone through of how you've taken direction from a younger boss or younger team members or whatever, or just give an example of like how you would handle that situation. Right. Okay. You know, but if I did have a younger boss, I would be very open to their suggestions. I would look to them because they're in a leadership role. I would look to them to be a leader. And I would feel that my experience could also bring significant contributions to the team because I may have a lot of life experience that they don't have yet. So I think there's a great benefit for someone of my age to be on the team, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and you tailor that to how you would, but that's how you address any of these biases. If you feel that you're in an interview and that these biases are going on, um, first impression, of course, you know, dress well, be professional, you know, that one's easy to, to overcome, but these other ones, you kind of will get a gut feeling in the interview if, you know, these things are going on. And so just kind of, it's a fluid thing, right? You may not always get these, um, especially a trained interviewer, we try to remove bias. Um, that's why you get multiple rounds of interviews as well. If you've ever, ever wondered that. So we can try to remove the bias in the interview process as much as possible and, and get someone that is based on their, their um, actual ability to, to contribute to the team instead of, Oh, I like this person. Cause I like the same, you know, shoe company as me or whatever. Um, so that's how we overcome bias. Just address it as it, as it arises, or as you sense it arises, just address it up front. Um, and then that way, even if the interviewer, you know, because sometimes they may be uncomfortable, obviously legally, they can't ask you, Hey, if you're older, are you going to have issues with a younger boss? You're going to get a, you, you immediately contact an employment attorney and, and, you know, and get their advice. But more nine times out of 10, you're going to get some kind of a settlement because that's simply a legal question to ask. So again, bias, just deal with it up front um, and, and address it as it, as it might arise in the interview process. But again, if you're showing that you're a high performer, um, the bias, even if it's there, it'll go away because they, going back to the interview's greatest fear of like, hey, I don't want to get fired, you know, one of those fears there, they also don't want to get in trouble that if you're a high performer and because the interviews are usually recorded, someone else looks at that and they're like, well, this is a high performer. Why did you move them forward? Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, they can't come out and say, oh, it's because they were older, right? Or it's because they were black or Latino or they were white or whatever. They can't do that, right? Because they're going to get fired immediately. And, you know, you're probably going to get someone reaching out to you, you know, hopefully to try to prevent you from suing and things like that. So anyways, let's jump into behavioral interview questions. Um, problem action result, I already mentioned this, you know, you can use star method if you want to, but the biggest thing here is preparing in advance. So you have actual scenarios. So whatever question they throw at you, and most of them are in similar categories, really what we're trying to determine is, have you been in similar situations or can you think of a similar situation that would apply in the scenario I asked you about. So I can see that you're a problem solver. That's really all the behavioral interview questions are looking for. Are you a problem solver if we put you in different situations? That's it. So that's why it's so important to practice these because these are a good chunk of your actual um, scoring on interviews. So things like your body language is important. The power of your words, of course, actually sharing, you know, specific metrics. So for example, if I ask someone, if I'm an untrained interviewer and I ask someone this question, you know, where it's got a question mark at the end. So any question they ask you with a question mark at the end, you can know in your head after this session that that's an untrained interviewer because trained interviewers ask you something or with a period at the end. And I'll give you an example. So how would you handle a difficult customer with a question mark there that opens it up to you giving you some theoretical answer you read in a book? Like this is not specific. And you might answer with a specific, but most people can give a theoretical, you know, thing, whatever. Now, if I say, tell me about a time you handled a difficult customer, 
period at the end of that, right? It's a slight change on the words, but I'm asking you for a specific example. Now, for all of you on this call, when you get asked, if you get asked, you know, with a question mark at the end, like, how would you handle a difficult customer? Don't go theoretical, have a specific answer, impress them, show them that you control this interview, that this is your space, this is your time to shine, that you're the expert, that you're a high performer, and you're going to do well. Because it also makes it easier on them because they don't know oftentimes that they're not trained well as interviewers because they don't get trained, right? So they're just thrown in the mix from these companies. Uh, some words to avoid, and, and the reason why is because these are words that show weakness. They kind of put the... the um, the ownership of whatever the project was or the situation on somebody else, like, oh, they did, you know, this, you did this and you're them, things like that. Words you want to use for high performer. I did this, you know, and the more specific, like I did this, Gina did this, Sally did this on this project, you know, to help the customer. And this was the end result that happened. You know, we did this, you know, it, it happened to us. And so this is what we did Our, you know, et cetera. So just, you know, again, Change in words, but it has such a huge impact on your ability in your interview to get to the next stage and also to get high, to command very high offers. Self-sabotage, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but, you know, can you just ask yourself in your head, can you think of some things that would sabotage you during an interview? Um, and these are some of the things, right? You're dependent on a single steel to, to, you know, make it all magical. You're resistant to change. You see this a lot with um, older IT people that don't want to learn any cloud-based skills. Guess what? Most companies these days are using some kind of a cloud environment. So you better get up to, up to par on that. Um, you got to constantly be learning. If you want a cybersecurity job, for those that are newer to this and trying to get your first job, it's never-ending learning. I still, I still, you know, learn stuff. Right? I still go. Gina still goes. You know, all of us at the that you see and we look like we're crushing on social media. We're putting in a ton of hours behind the scenes to learn all this stuff. Um, not adaptable. No attention to detail, etc. I'm not going to read all those. But basically, we want to see that you're a team player. We want to see that you're multi-skilled, that you're constantly learning, that you're open to change, that you can adapt to different situations. Because honestly, in cybersecurity world, things are going to change instantly sometimes. And they usually happen like Friday night, five o'clock or around this time when you want to go home and all of a sudden, you know, the jerk hackers get in and, and mess things up. So last slide here. Um, number one, get your mind right, get focused, use the, the self-assessment I mentioned. Also, you know, write out what you want to happen. Um, this actually helps quite a bit. So when I say write out, don't say I want, just talk about the interview as if it happened. So for example, say, you know, if you know, like, like Gina's interviewing you, for example, so the interview with Gina went so well, uh, it, you know, she didn't ask me any difficult questions. I had a, I had a, a phenomenal answer for every question she did ask. It really felt like a conversation with a friend. It didn't even feel like an interview. And she quickly moved me to the next round of interviews. Bam. Right. And guess what? Even if that doesn't happen, maybe it didn't happen for some other reason. Maybe it wasn't the right job for you or whatever, but this stuff actually works. Again, that book I mentioned earlier, the intention experiment backs it up with science. So um, everyone that's used it, it happens quite a bit. The minimum thing it does, it puts you in a positive mindset which helps so much when you go into an interview because now you feel comfortable because you already wrote out what's going to happen. So you already know what's going to happen. So now you just go into the interview, chill, laid back. It's all good. Um, create the short slide deck I mentioned, ask about their challenges. If you can, if you know, try to solve their problems. And then as part of that, thank you. You send them, if you get a problem out of them, send them a, your thoughts on a solution to that problem, you know, whatever that problem is. Um, there's a, a good example is uh, an attorney that a friend of mine knows uh, he, uh, he, you know, uh, the friend of mine owns an interview software company anyways. Um, and also a hiring, um, software company. They work with a lot of the big companies and, and stuff. Um, anyways, long story short, uh, he worked with, uh, this attorney that's an older attorney and, you know, was worried about ageism. And, uh, and so essentially he's like, look, just go in the interview, ask them some of the problems and then send them a detailed solution and a thank you. So that's exactly what he did. Cause in the interview, they didn't move into the next round. But even though he didn't move to the next round, he had asked about a problem they had. Uh, they actually gave him three problems. He picked one of those. He wrote, like he solved it as if he worked there already as an attorney. He sent that to them uh, via certified mail, you know, mailed it to them. They were so impressed with that. They called him back. They, uh, they created a job for him because they had already filled the one. They created a job, which was double the salary they were going to offer for the original role he applied at. So he got double the money and a, and a better job and you know all this stuff just by figuring out a problem they had sending them his thoughts on a solution to it and, and being in depth. And you may not, if you're new to cyber stuff, you may, may not be able to go too in depth on things, but go as deep as you can and send that to them. Hey, you mentioned this on the interview. Here's a problem. Even if they don't move, move you to the next round, but you really want a job there at that company. Hey, here's, you know, here's the problem you mentioned on the call. 
And here's my solution for that. And if you don't feel that the person you interviewed with will be receptive to, to that, figure out who the executive is over that department and send them a certified letter with your solution or send them, you know, FedEx with it. Someone's going to be impressed there. And even if they don't have a job now, you've impressed them. You're in their mind. They may know somebody that has a job open for you. And now you're, now you're someone that they trust because you solved a problem for them. So I've talked a ton and sometimes I do that. I try to talk fast, but <laughs> sometimes I do that. Let me stop sharing my screen now. Um, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and answer questions. I didn't keep track in the chat. So um, I don't know if you have uh, what to, oh, can I briefly, uh, so I'm taking Felicia's question first. And I'm going to scroll up in the chat and answer these. So can I briefly go over what to include in the slide deck? Yes. Um, so five slides basically is, is what I recommend. It keeps it short and sweet. So first, number one, first slide is just kind of a, a very short intro to you. Like how many years, you know, I've got 10 years experience and, you know, just make it related to the job though. Very specific. And slides two, three, and four are going to be your 30 day, 60 day, and 90 day plans. It could be, um, if you know a problem that might be solved with the job, you can do it that way. You can be like, here's, you know, my 30, 60, 90 day plans to solve a problem. Uh, in most cases, you might not know that up front. So um, it's probably easier just to go with like, here's what I plan to do uh, in the first 30, 60 day, and 90 days on the job, you know. Um, and then last slide is just kind of a quick, you know, quick three to five bullet points of, um, you know, of your skills directly related to the job, like things they were asking for the, in the, in the um, job posting. Or it could also be uh, transferable skills that match to the, um, you know, the job posting. Uh, next question I see, and uh, I promise I'll keep scrolling up the chat too. Um, how do you answer the dreaded, what are your salary requirements? Um, there is, uh, let me, I've got a, I won't, I won't share it on screen because I can't share it, it's proprietary. Um, but let me see if I can find it real quick. Because there is a great answer to that question that I always recommend, and I can't think of it off the top of my head, but there's a great answer to that question. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, uh, bear with me all, apologies on that. Uh, um, uh, of course I can't find it. Uh, anyways, um, off the top of my head, the way I'm gonna answer that, which I think is pretty similar to how I tell people to answer that normally, uh, is, um, you know, Hey, what do you want? What are your salary requirements? Whatever. But like, well, um, you know, I'm sure we can discuss salary at the appropriate time. Are you opposed to sharing the budget range for this role? Most of the time they'll tell you the budget range for the role. Um, it's pretty rare. They won't, but you have to word it. So this comes from, um, I think his name is Chris Voss, former FBI host. He's got a book on negotiation, uh, former FBI host, host negotiator. But anyways, um, are you opposed to, is, is one of the things he, I think he mentions in the book or his videos or whatever. Um, but that's where I learned it at years ago. And anyways, are you opposed to most people are gonna be like, well, no, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. Right. That's of course I'll share the salary you know range with you, but you never want to tell them the salary range up front. So to answer that question directly, the way I would answer it is, you know, I'm sure we can discuss salary and, and other, you know, compensation at the appropriate time. Are you opposed to sharing the budgeted range for the role? And just you know, see what they say. Again, most of the time they'll say yes. Um, it may, it's probably a red flag if they don't. If they're constantly like, "Well, I'm not sharing that," but you need to tell me, be like, "Well, uh, you know, you probably want to step away from that because they, they're they're." Um, I'm trying not to curse, but you, you know what they are. We'll just for those that curse, you know, you know what I would probably say there. So, anyways, um, let me. Um, I don't know, Gene. I don't know, Gene. If you kept track, I'm just going to go through chat real quick, and then I'll get to the more recent questions. I'm going to try to scroll through and get the people that had asked questions earlier too. Um, I just want to make sure that we, um, uh, I need the TPS report. Oh, good. Somebody has actually watched that movie. Cool. Um, uh, the, the office, so office space is the name of the movie I mentioned. Um, again, uh, you can, uh, take a look at that on, um, I think you see, you see some clips and stuff on YouTube. Um, should you send the thank you for each round of interviews? So Phoenix asked, should you send the thank you for each round of interviews or just the technical ones? Um, I would send, I, I mean, honestly, uh, so if you're moving to the next step, I would not send it to the recruiter. Um, I mean, you could send it like a thank you, thanks for meeting or whatever. Um, but if they're already moving you to the next step of interviews, you probably don't need to thank the recruiter. I would focus on like the hiring manager at that point because that's who's going to make the decision. It doesn't hurt to just send a quick thank you or something, but you know that, that's what I would do there. Uh, what questions can I ask in the interview to gauge culture? Um, you should really research that beforehand. So reach out to people on like LinkedIn that work there and just send them like, hey, would be good to connect. Like don't, and then when you connect with them, when they accept it, just like, hey, 
um, how do you like work in there? Like I'm looking at a role there. Cause you never know that person might know the hiring manager. Or they might be the hiring manager. So you never know how that might play out. Uh, in the interview, I, I, it's to me that my personal opinion is too late to ask about company culture. You should know that in advance. Um, you could ask something like if the person you're interviewing with, like the HR person has been there a few years, uh, you could ask something like, what do you like most about working here? Um, again, you may not have time to ask that question, but that could be a question you ask to kind of see like, what is their answer to that? Most of them ramble for like five, 10 minutes. They, I've never had one answer it like directly. They ramble about generic stuff for five or 10 minutes and say, oh, that's great. You know, um, but anyways, you can ask a question like that, but typically I would just ask that up front of people on social media to find out for sure. Cause they'll tell you the real truth on social media. Uh, my last question, was there anything I have stated or didn't state that would give you a pause? Um, oh, okay. So Poppy is adding that in there. So this is the question. If you didn't see that in the chat earlier, um, this is one that Poppy asked in, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing your name. So if I butcher your names, forgive me on that. I'm, sometimes I'm bad with names. Um, the question they normally, this person normally asks is, was there anything I have stated or didn't state that would give you a pause? If so, I would enjoy an opportunity to add clarity as to why I'm the perfect fit for this role. Um, yeah. And you could take that and you can modify, you know, how you answer that if you want to um, truncate it down a little bit. Uh, can you have a successful career in cybersecurity with an associate's degree in search? Yeah, you don't you don't need search for degrees. Contrary to what people on social media will tell you, especially the ones that are selling you search and degrees, uh, you don't need that crap. The biggest thing you need to do, and that's my personal opinion, some so certifications, depending on where you work, are are checkbox, and that's just the way it is. So you may have to get some certs. College degrees at larger companies help you get up to the next level of pay scale for your individual role. So they are helpful. Do you need to go put yourself in a hundred grand in debt to get your first job? Heck no, that's stupid. Um, I'm, I'm even against, um, and I know people will hate on this, but I'm not a fan of you putting yourself in debt to go to boot camps and stuff, right. Or get college degrees like that. It doesn't make any sense to me because you already have everything you need within you and you can get a lot of stuff for free. You can do a lot of stuff for free. You just have to learn how to sell yourself better. That's it's just sales. That's all it is. So to your question directly, um, Zania, and please forgive me if I butchered your name, uh, you don't necessarily need you know, degrees and certs. Um, and I don't think you're holding yourself back, um, but you want to look at the role you're applying for. Are they requiring a cert? And it might be required based on contracts, especially if they contract in the federal government space. So you may have to get cert. The way around that is um, on your resume, if you, like they say you need SEC plus, Put you, just buy a $10 course on Udemy or something and say you're studying for Security Plus or buy a book and put on your resume, you're studying for CompTIA Security Plus. So when they are searching for keywords in the ATS, your resume flags and they pull you in for an interview. And then you can explain it in the interview. Yeah, I'm studying for it. Um, you know, I'm saving the money right now for the exam voucher because the hiring manager might say, oh, well, we can just pay for there. Where are you at in your studies? Are you almost done? And because for them, it's just, it, they don't mind paying for these certs. It's just, you got to, you got to sell yourself, you know, in, you know, in the role. And again, that depends on the employer, but um, you don't necessarily need the cert. You can just put on your resume that you're studying for it and that can get you in the interview. And then if you wow them in the interview, um, I, I can tell you right now as a hiring manager, if you wow me in the interview, you're going to get trained. I'm going to put you through training that you don't even want because I want to see you succeed. Um, okay. A couple questions on the slide deck again. Oh, I think I'm down in the other ones. Okay, cool. Uh, what's the best way to answer when asked if we have any questions? Um, so it's that, that, so the number one question is, uh, I think your name is going to be pronounced Lene, but again, if I butcher it, just, um, beat up through, you know, send hate mail to Gina if I mess up your name. Um, but, uh, what's the best way to answer when asked if we have any questions that, that number one question I, I said, right. Which is, uh, basically what seems to be missing from the, the other candidates you've interviewed so far. And then just shut up, let them answer. They'll usually ramble for five, 10 minutes on, you know, whatever. Um, and they'll tell you exactly what's missing. So if they're like, yeah, candidates don't have experience in this. If you don't have experience in that, you can say, okay, well, you know, thanks for telling me that. Yeah, you know, I'm actually taking, you know, or when you get to the next round of interviews, you can say, yeah, I'm actually uh, taking, you know, or again, in the thank you, you can say, yeah, you know, I, you mentioned in the interview that a lot of candidates didn't have experience with Splunk, for example, and I've only got Curator experience, but I went ahead and I signed up for some Splunk training because I'm very passionate about this role. I, I want to contribute to the team once, you know, I receive, you know, once we move forward and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they're like, okay, cool. This person wants to be here. 
right? And so that's so that's the the question I would ask. You can also ask other questions too, which you can find on you know online and things like that. Or, you know whatever questions you have. But that question I would ask the very first question because that gives you intelligence you need for the other parts of the interview process, and it also impresses them quite a bit. Uh, there's a question on where the slides. Oh, I see Gina already answered that. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll share the slides with Gina so she can share that out. Um, uh, anyone have any additional questions at all? Um, yeah, feel Andrew, free. I think uh, can can anyone? Yeah, I say can we? Are we allowed to unmute them, Gina? Or will you beat me up? Oh man, not not Tony Briscoe. Oh man, uh, you know it's gonna be he's gonna be brutal. Oh no. No, you know this first. This is this is great, man. But I, I did have a question. So um, I just got moved to the third final round of interviews for an opportunity I applied for. Okay. Yeah, my challenge is in order to even get to the second level of interviews you had to select you were okay with the salary range. And I'm going to be honest, I was not. But I hadn't interviewed in a while. <laughs> I wanted the interview experience. And so now, you know, in the final round, I'm just wondering, like, from an integrity piece, uh, I've probably blacklisted myself from the company if because of this. But I mean, the salary, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a $50,000 pay cut, right? But the opportunity is like still great. I can see within a year of, you know, being able to do some other things that I don't have exposure to now. But my question to you is like, if I bring up salary, depending on after this final round, like I'm just wondering, like, how do I navigate these spaces now? Because technically it is an integrity issue, right? I said, hey, I'm OK with this salary range, but I really wasn't. But I really needed to get my head back in the game of interviewing. I'll land that plane there. So I guess the question I would have is in your opinion, Tony, do you really think that in the next couple of years, this company base wise can get you back to your level or beyond that based on the role? Cause you mentioned it's got a lot of opportunity, but, but just realistically, do you think that they can get you there? If there's any hesitation, um, then you may want to, you know, look, look at other things. I can't tell you what to do, but to your question directly, um, it's a 50 grand pay cut. So, I mean, when you, when you get to the round of where you're actually negotiating and they're like, all right, you know, we want you just be transparent, be like, look, I mean, to be honest with you, that base is 50 grand lower, you know, than I'm making now, you know, and I would, you know, you know, you know, me, I, I go above that's 70 grand lower than I'm making now, you know, I'm, that's 80 grand, you know, that's, that's an 80 grand pay cut or whatever, you know, tell, tell, you know, I, I would inflate the numbers a little bit. Cause I mean, come on, they're going to, they're going to make a lot of money off you, Tony. Um, and so I would, uh, you know, so whatever you can stick with the 50 grand, but I would say that, um, you know, that that's significantly lower than I make now. You don't have to tell them the number, but you could say, you know, is, you know, are, are you opposed to us doing a sign on bonus? And so you may want to tell them the number, you know, because a lot of places will do a sign on bonus to get you closer in that first year. And then if you're wowing them, then you should be able to get the base up or you might get more, you know, stock or whatever, you know, if it's, a, if it's a startup, stock options are going to be worthless for the vast majority of startups out there. So I wouldn't bank your, your wealth on that, but for bigger companies, you know, which it seems like this probably is, um, then, then you can make that up in equity as well. But I would try to get a sign on bonus with them and, you know, and you may just be transparent, Tony, and say, look, this is 50 grand less base than I'm making now. Are you opposed to us figuring out how we can do a sign on bonus to try to make up for that? Cause I'm really passionate about this role. I really, you know, I, I know I can come in and, and make some very good contributions to this team, but at the same time, I have to be mindful of other offers I have on the table. And it's not their business. You don't have other offers. They, they can't check that, you know, forget them. Um, but that, that puts you, you know, that keeps your integrity, right? Cause you said you're okay with that, but Hey, let, there's wiggle room. Like, let's be realistic. They know that. And a lot of companies do that to try to pin you in a box and be like, Oh, well we said, you know, whatever, everything's negotiable. If they're impressed with you, Tony, which you're moving forward in the round. So they're obviously seeing something then it's negotiable and you can usually get a sign on bonus because for them, it's a one-time expense. And then from there, you know, and they could justify that. Usually they may, you may not get 50 grand to be honest with you, but you might get 20 or 30, you know, so it, it takes a little of the, the hurt away on that first, you know, um, year of, of, you know, base or whatever. Uh, but again, if, if you don't feel that in a couple of years with this opportunity that you can accelerate in the company and get that base back, um, I mean, you're, I don't know if your financial situation, you got to really look at that though, because 50 grand, I mean, 
um, you know, even, even when you're a millionaire, 50 grand is still like, what, what's going on? You know, wh wh where'd that go? Um, you know, I, I know people on social media be like, ah, 50 grand ain't nothing. Yeah. You ain't got 50 grand though. If you really dig into their, their stuff, we could go all day. I could, I could call out some people on social media that claim they got money, but anyways, um, they don't really have it, but that's, that'd be my, that'd be what I would do in your situation. Tony is I would, um, I would just come back at them when, when they're actually ready to make you an offer, say, you know, I, you know, and especially if they make you an offer, be like, I appreciate that. You know, I, I am comfortable with the range of this role. However, or, or actually, instead of however, I would say, but, you know, the, like I mentioned earlier, say but or because, but that's a significant drop from the base I'm at now. In fact, it's a 50K drop. Are you opposed to us figuring out a way to, to do a sign-on bonus that can, you know, you know, maybe we can't get the 50 grand, but, you know, let's try to work together to find something that makes sense. Because again, I really want to, to come on the team and contribute, you know, I know I can make a, a real impact, you know, very quickly, but at the same time, I have to be mindful of, you know, the other offers I have on, on the table yeah. um, and do what's best for my, you know, yeah. my, my family and situation. You know, they yeah. may still say like, this is all you get. Got it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. And it, it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a nonprofit, you know, organization, but free educational benefits, um, like free, like if I wanted to get a master's degree, they pay for it. If I wanted to get a doctorate, they pay for it. So I was looking long-term at some of those, but I and, appreciate yeah, that okay. response. Um, yeah, man. I mean, you know, so in that situation, right. Uh, if you do take it, I better see 12 degrees on your LinkedIn, man. Yes, sir. Understood. <laughs> understood. My, la my last question for you. So I, and I, I probably shouldn't have asked this question. I started listening to a book, get hired in 60 seconds, a little late, but my question I asked that I didn't really get a I didn't get a great answer from Ken. I asked them, what do they, what is a 60 to 90 day success plan for the candidate coming into this role and what their expectations for were from the gap that's been missing in this position for three months now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they may not know. Okay. Um, and that might be why there's, there's a position that's, you know, unfilled. Got because it. because they they may not have the clarity. I mean, in fact, a lot of hiring managers don't know what the heck to do with you. They just they just know I'm too busy. I need to hire somebody. I I fought for to get somebody. I've got budget now, and now I got to interview all these people, and I don't really know what to do yet. So there. So honestly, in that situation, Tony, you may want to. I I know you're moving to the next round, but you may want to already have kind of a you know your thoughts in place of what you would do because I know your experience. You know, you're not a newbie on on this call, so. Uh, my suggestion is, and this is, is this a nonprofit that you, th th we're still talking about the nonprofit? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, definitely a nonprofit. They, they have no clue what to do with you, Tony. So yeah, definitely you'll want to come in with a, you know, kind of a game plan. Like this is what, um, similar organizations would typically have me do. You know, you don't, you don't want to make it look like you're coming in like, ah, I'm the greatest, but you want to come in like, Hey, this is what a similar place might have me do. Um, just want to give you some ideas because I, I didn't know if you had, you know, a specific roadmap or whatever. Now they're very, now they're totally in love with you, Tony, because they're like, oh my God, this guy just gave me what I need for metrics. You know, the KPI, I, I got to report back to my boss. He literally just gave me the roadmap and I'm going to pretend it's my idea. And I, but Tony's my favorite guy now. So yeah, he can get those masters and doctors, you know, whatever else, you know? So yeah, that's, that's how I would do that one. Just sometimes you have to guide them, you know, and uh, for everyone on the call, the, the, the easiest way not to get fired is to make your boss's life easier and make their boss's life easier. The more you do that, the more you're going to start to see your coworkers get fired and laid off and things like that. And you become the person that is, I mean, they, you're like the last one laid off usually, unless you're at a very massive company where you're just a number on a spreadsheet, but usually if they do cuts, it's everybody else. And you're the person that's still sticking around because you made everybody's life easier because I don't keep problem maker problem. You know, people are causing trouble. You're the first to go. So if you cause trouble, if you're on this call and you're, you know, you're a troublemaker, you're gone. You're going to be the first to go. So just keep that in mind, make people's life easier. You'll be good. Um, Phoenix. I see you have a question. What's a good period period to expect you've been ghosted. So these days, man, some of these companies are taking like six months to reach back out on a phone screen. So, I mean, it, it's, it's hit and miss. I would, um, I think the best thing to do is, and, and also HR and recruiters are quiet, quietly quitting too. So they don't even give the hiring manager your resume sometimes and your stuff. So I would try to figure out, um, try to make contacts at the company, try to also figure out who might the hiring manager be and try to contact them directly. Like if you, and not like two days later, but like give it a, give it a couple of weeks. If you haven't heard anything, uh, just, you know, try to reach out to some people at the company say, Hey, you know, I applied for this role. I didn't hear anything. I just want to, do you have any, 
insight into the hiring process? Like, does it normally take a you know a month or two to hear something, or you know, because if you haven't even gotten a rejection, um, and it could be that they have a long process because they they got a lot of applications. Could be that the HR person, like I said, is quietly quitting and they didn't, you know, they're like, forget you, I quit tomorrow, you know, type of thing. So um, it could be any of those things. So that's the best way to approach that. There's really no, like these days, there's really no period uh, because you don't want to wait for months and months, but some companies do take months and months, but in the interim, you might find a better offer. So I wouldn't wait on any company if your plan was to wait, you know, on company X before you go apply for others. I would just keep, you know, hammering things until you get an offer. Um you went for the million. I forget what I said there, but yeah, yeah. You, I'm expensive, so a lot of companies. Um, I, in fact, I I have a friend that's a, he owns a company, and uh, they he reached out on a call one time, and and we we chatted because they he wanted to to step away as CEO and bring me on board. Uh, but we chatted a little bit, and he's like, "Look, we can't afford you." Um, and we didn't even talk about an offer, but he's like, "We can't afford you right now." He's like, "I'll reach back out when we can." I was like, "Okay." Um, so, but that's when you're a high performer, when you interview well, like, like we talked about on this call, that's, that's what happens. People reach out to you for roles eventually in your career. Like people, like they reach out and they know they can't afford you. Like you, you come with a price. So eventually as you grow your career, kind of like Tony, like Tony's got a price, like they know they got to come with something for Tony. Cause he, you know, he's got a lot he brings to the table and you want to put your, yourself in that same you know situation. Um, let me see real quick. Um, I know we're over time. So thanks everyone for uh, jumping on board. Uh, how to combat nerves. So Morgana, Morgana, uh, or Morgana, uh, again, send the hate mail to Gina, if I pronounce your name wrong. Um, well, how to combat nerves and jitters in the interview preparation. Number one thing, plus the mindset stuff I mentioned, writing out what's, what the interview is going to, what, like exactly what's going to happen in it. That helps so much with calming your nerves. Um, before the interview, just, um, do a little meditation. Um, there's a lady, uh, I may not spell her name correctly, but just look up this lady and like meditation stuff or whatever on YouTube. Uh, she's got a bunch of videos and uh, like just listen to one of her videos on something around meditation, just something to relax your mind. Um, a lot of the meditation stuff out there is just junk just to get you to view the video so they can get some money from YouTube. Um, but her stuff is pretty good. It's very actionable. Uh, but that's the biggest stuff Morgan, Morgana or Morgana um, is, is preparation. The more you prepare for something, um, it's just like uh, back back in the day, I had a different life in the special operations community in the military, and we train so much. And so when you actually go out and do stuff, you're, you're it's just natural. It's it's you're comfortable. You're um, obviously you're you're stressed because it's you know a stressful job, but but you don't have the nerves and jitters. You're you're just you know we you you never the way we used to say it is you never rise to the occasion. You fall to the level of your training. And in the same way for interviews, you fall to the level of your preparation for interviews. So the more you prepare, the easier it is to, when you go into the interview, you feel comfortable because you're like, well, you know, whatever. I mean, if this doesn't work out, I already wrote out what's going to happen. But if that doesn't happen for some reason, I'm totally cool with that because I know that something better is going to come along. And when you tell when you get your mind thinking like that, thinking positive versus thinking negative, like most people, you get so relaxed, so comfortable, like life becomes honestly so much easier. You still have challenges, but it becomes you know so much, so much easier. Um, I'm looking for any other questions. Uh, good luck. Okay. Um, any other questions anyone has? I mean, feel free to raise your hand or or throw them in chat, um, and we'll I, we'll get them answered for you. I had a question. My name is Naya. Naya J. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. I um I want to know about like when you get the offer and then you're kind of negotiating, um. I know you can negotiate like base salary, stock options, PTO, but maybe what else can you negotiate to kind of stack your offer, especially if the base salary isn't up to par? Yeah, so great question. Depends a lot on the company. Um, larger companies are going to be pretty limited, but what you can, you might be able to do at a larger company is negotiate like um, that you, let's say they're in person, that you can work from home every Friday or um, let's say it's remote that maybe you can take Friday afternoons off, you know, or leave a little early or something like that. So little things like that you could do. Uh, most companies these days have like what they call a limited vacation, even though they really don't want you to take a limited vacation. Uh, most of them start complaining when you take like 30 days or more a year. But anyways, uh, if it's a company still with like PTO, you might be able to negotiate an extra week or two. If it's a smaller company, um, I know, I, I don't know them directly, but I know a professor at a, at a community college in a, in a state up North and, 
they had a student because uh, their students are in demand, like the local companies hire them like before they graduate. And so this one student uh, had a couple offers from bigger companies that were obviously much more base than the base salary than the other uh, place could do. But the smaller company was like, like, what can we do to get you? Like, we really, really want you. And so they're like, well, I want to, uh, if you all know the Jeep Rubicon vehicles, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, th this guy was like, I want, I want one of those. And so what they did is they worked, um, they worked with a local dealership and they were like, can, can we do a, a used one? Like, you know, will you take a used one? And he's like, yeah, that's cool. So they worked with a local dealership and they got him, I think it was like two years old or something, but he got basically a, you know, a Jeep Rubicon as part of his sign-on bonus with That's a smaller nice. company so like depending on the size of the company you can probably like smaller company i mean it doesn't hurt to ask you can even <laughs> a big big company you could be like hey or you know is there any room you know i would really love a jeep rubicon right or you know and you could joke you could joke you'd be like i really love a rolls royce you know ha 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 and they may be like well we can't do that but we could do a toyota you know and be like okay cool yeah whatever you know because you could always sell the car for you know 10 20 grand or whatever and have, have yourself a nice little bonus so anything anything that you can really think of um, you could also negotiate, Tony mentioned, you know, the education component where he's looking at that nonprofit. You could also try to negotiate that too. You could try to see if they'll pay uh, for you to go like get a sand cert once a year. That's maybe paid by the, by your team's budget. They're like, look, I'd really like to get a sand cert. Can we negotiate where maybe in year one and year two, I go get one sand cert each year as part of my sign-on bonus. Um, I mean, you know, I would just honestly uh, Naya, I would honestly just take a piece of paper and just kind of brainstorm and just, you know, and over the weekend and then set it aside for a couple of days and go back to that piece of paper and brain, you know, or your phone notes or whatever, and go back and brainstorm some more, like anything you could even probably convince them to buy you books or get you a membership to um, like packed publishing or O'Reilly or, or something like that, or, or, or even get them to, um, if you want about, um, you got me thinking professional um, memberships. I'm a member of. Yeah, the yeah. Association for Talent yeah. Development. So, yeah, I yeah, do you that, can that yeah. membership every year. Yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. Yeah, try it. Try it. I mean, the worst yeah. thing they could say is no, but you could say, "Look, I'm, I'm, you know." And when when you when you do like professional memberships, give them a because. So I would I would really it'd be really great if you know if you were able to pay for some of my professional membership associations because these allow me to network that that allows the company to brand even more in areas where maybe they're, you know, the, the name's not known. And also it allows me to grow professionally. I'm able to make mm -hmm. connections and resources that we can reach out to and guest speakers and, you know, whatever um, you figure out the list, but, but always give them a because, because they're, they're normally going to have to go back on certain things to negotiate it with their boss or with um, senior leadership to get more budget or whatever. Uh, so as, as an example, one time, many years ago, I, I, uh, I was at an interview and, and of course, you know, they, we can't afford you um, type of thing. Um, cause, cause they asked like what I was looking for. And I just told them and they're like, Oh God, that's like double what we were thinking. And I was like, okay, well, no, no big deal. It was great to meet you. Um, but they, <laughs> they actually uh, went back to uh, the executive that I met with, went back to the, the senior leadership team and the board. And they said, look, we really want this guy. Like he's going to come in and, and, and they actually were setting the bar oh, low of what they thought. And so, um, so anyways, they came back with, you know, an appropriate offer. I came on board there and I blasted their expectations out of the water. Uh, and so like, I, I literally never asked for a raise when I was with that company, it just happened. And, and they, I never had a performance review. They just did them and gave me five stars, you know, hundred percent every single time. Um, so you get situations like that too, where, where they're going to go back and fight for you if they really want you. Um, same thing with you, Tony. I mean, it's a nonprofit, so they're probably limited on, on the base they can offer, but if you want a new car, you know, they might be able to do that, you know, for you, whatever. So yeah, anything professional memberships, if you want certifications, if you want them to pay for college degrees, I mean, they, they might work with a local college where their headquarters is. And so you might get it from some college there, you know, and that's fine. It's a degree is a degree. I yeah. mean, Har you know, Harvard yeah. philosophy graduates still work in at fast food, the same as a philosophy graduate from like university of Texas or whatever, you know, it's a, it's a degree and they're still working at fast food because they chose a philosophy degree and not a you know, a degree where they can go out and get a job. So anyways, that's my thought. No, it's no shame to anyone, by the way, with a philosophy degree on the call. Don't hate me for that. But college, college I mean, all, college, the college you go to only matters in certain circles. And realistically, these days, those circles are very, very small. And and you can get in them other ways, too. And you probably don't want to be in them anyways. Um, did, I, did I answer your question, Diane? Yep, you did answer my question. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Um, I mean, any any other questions anyone has? And if you can't think of any right now, if you think of some, um, Gina and I both share my um, LinkedIn, I think, in the chat. She can grab that and connect with you. Um, I will say, if you haven't sent a connection request already, send a message you were on this webinar because otherwise you go in the pool. And I think, I think I've got like 4,000 requests right now. Um, of course, all of you will show up recently, but that just helps me know you're not a threat actor. You still might be a threat actor, but it lets me know at least you're a human and, uh, and I can, you know, carve through those pretty quickly and accept them faster. I know some of you on the call are already co uh, connected to me on LinkedIn. Um, but again, feel free to reach out. I mean, I'm not, I know some people would have put a pay paywall up or something like, oh, you, you can't talk to me. I'm, I'm a great, you know, executive in cybersecurity. You can't talk to me, but I'm not that person. I'm very laid back and stuff like that. So um, any other questions at all? If not, we'll wrap it up. And I appreciate everyone that, that was able to stay later. I know we ran over. Um, I, I Like I said, I talk a lot sometimes, so deal with it. <laughs> Anyways, that's just me. Gina and, I, Gina and I actually were talking before the session. Like I'm, I'm me, I'm not going to change. Um, it'd be the same thing uh, if you meet me in person too. So um, like Gina said, uh, probably early next week, she's going to circulate the recording as well as the slide deck. Uh, and I think she already circulated the questions. If you didn't get, get those, it might go to spam or something like that. Um, you can always also, if you don't see them, you can always just reach out to me. I've got, I've got the list of questions so I can share it with you as well. So um, yeah, it looks like, I think we're all done, Gina. I don't see any other questions at all. Oh, uh, what is Gina's bank account info? Uh, do you mind sharing that with us all, Gina, real quick? Uh, Tony got me, Tony has me. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, well, yeah, I mean, thanks again, everyone. Appreciate you spending some of your Friday night with this. Hopefully this was helpful. And um, please keep me posted as you use this stuff in interviews of your success. I mean, I, I want to celebrate you. I want to give you a shout out on LinkedIn, you know, if you if you land, you know, that role or whatever. Um, it, it helps also with your branding. If you're if you're finishing anything right now and, and you want to shout out, like if you're finishing a cert or degree or, or you know, you completed a course, I mean, don't hesitate to ping me. I don't mind like, you know, hey, look, you know, Morgana did this, you know, Naya did this, check it out, you know, cause it gets you, I mean, a lot of people follow me, a lot of hiring managers follow me. So you never know what that might lead to just giving you the shout out like that. So anyways, I'll stop eating up your Friday nights, go enjoy yourselves, eat some good food and, and hang with family and friends and just have a good weekend, everyone.